this will be a bit, uh, a bit improvised, um, since it's not exactly the way I designed it. Uh, but okay. So I anyway, so um, I mean, I, I wanted to tell you a story involving Higgs bundles. Um, so uh, Higgs bundles, it's actually almost their um, 30th birthday. Uh, if you look at the date stamp on uh, Hitchens' original paper, it's September 15th, 1986. 19, yeah, 1986, right. Um, so uh, I mean, wh whatever else they are, they're holomorphic bundles with some extra structure. Uh, and they have many wonderful properties. Uh, they've had a pretty good first 30 years of life. Um, but uh, so uh, the feature that I want to concentrate on today, this is one of the sort of prominent features, is the relation between them and surface group representations. Um, so uh, let me see if things have restored themselves to life here. Um, so, okay, so, so we, to set the scene, we're going to start with um, just a topological surface. Uh, so a closed oriented surface of genus G, and we'll usually restrict it to be bigger than or equal to 2, and a group, a Lie group, um, which um, in this talk, I mean the groups that we'll see in this talk will be um, GLN and some of its real forms, uh, UPQ, um, SUPQ, uh, uh, some, some of the real forms of the um, orthogonal group will show up. But so basically any, um, any reductive uh, Lie group um, is fair game. Um, so given these, so you get, uh, so if you look at, so there's sort of three versions of a moduli space that are associated with this. The first one, which involves just the topological surface and group, is the space of representations of the fundamental group. So this is the surface group into G up to conjugation. Um, so this is, uh, this is the representation variety. Oh, the Sorry? Isn't that possible for the character variety? Some, sometimes it's called that, yeah. Um, and, uh, but so if this, for, for these groups, I mean, this space before you conjugate is uh, certainly a nice space. It's, um, you know, it lives inside the two g-fold product of g determined by one um, relation coming from uh, the relation defining the fundamental group. But when you quotient, it's not necessarily a nice space. You have to restrict to the reductive representations. If you, uh, if you allow yourself a smooth structure on the surface, then you can relate um, any representation to a, a, principal, a flat principal G bundle on S, a local system determined by the representation. Um, so that corresponds to the flat bundles, the flat principal G bundles on, still on S. The relation here is if I give you a flat structure, then the surface group representation you get is determined by the holonomy of that. And uh, that's a sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between the isomorphism classes of flat reductive bundles and homomorphisms. So this is just the topological data. This needs the data that you need to define connections. Um, and then if you go further and add a complex structure to S, so you turn S into a Riemann surface, so add a complex structure to S, and now I'll call that sigma, then you can talk about holomorphic bundles on S, and this is when you get the moduli space of Higgs bundles. And this is the space of polystable Higgs bundles. And I'll say more about what these are um, in a minute in the special cases that we're interested in. Um, so uh, so the, the, I mean, to get to this point, to get to the Higgs bundles, you have to add a whole you know, couple layers of structure 
um, over and above what you have here. But uh, the payoff is that it's all this extra structure gives you new tools that you can use to investigate, I mean, some, certainly the features of this, but then also through this correspondence, the features of um, these space of representations. So I, I want to um, sort of look at some situations um, where you see how this works and where um, some of the uh, sort of insights that you can see nicely from Higgs bundles are on display. Um, okay, so... Um, the situations where I, that I want to look at are situations where the group G is a real group. Um, and so uh, real forms of, actually it's going to be GLN, um, and I'm really going to focus on UPQ and its adjoint form PUPQ. That's really the one that we'll spend most of our time on. Um, but I just wanted to sort of give you um, sort of um, some inkling of the, some of the features that um, you see that, or that these representation varieties have for these real groups. So there's, this, there's situations where these representation varieties, oh, so I guess I should say the first thing is that, um, I mean, one of the features when the group is real is that the representation variety <coughs> in general has several components and in fact determining how many it has is the first first is the first thing where higgs bundles have turned out to be quite a useful tool um, it has several components and uh, there are cases where these components have special meaning where they have uh, sort of correspond to geometric structures or where there are interesting things going on um, and uh, the uh, sort of features that I wanted to um, focus on here are um, the relation to geometric structures. Actually, this one I won't be able to say too much about, but just a little bit. And also the um, appearance of subgroups of G is going to be an important thing. So representations that uh, actually factor through subgroups or somehow or in some other way involve subgroups. Um, so uh, yeah, let me just uh, give you some sort of brief survey. So if we take as our first case SL2R, so that's a nice, simple, real Lie group. Um, so in this case, the representation variety has, it has several components, and one of them is a copy of the Teichmüller space of S. So this corresponds to the, to the Fuchsian representations. That define hyperbolic structures or, or complex structures. Um, when you uh, identify this with its um, Higgs bundle buddy, um, so then we're Look, living in the moduli space of SL2R Higgs bundles on S with a complex structure, then you can, once you've fixed the complex structure, you can uh, look at the um, holomorphic tangent bundle of this, a uh, cotangent bundle, the canonical bundle, um, and the square of that has, the sections of the square of that are, are quadratic differentials in language that people in this room prefer. Um, and so, this, uh, so this, this component that corresponds to Teichmüller space um, is identified with the space of quadratic differentials um, in a nice Higgs bundle way, and this is one of the components in there. So this is a situation where you have nice geometric meaning. Um, if you look at... Uh, SLNR, so if you go from 2 to N, then um, this component has a nice analog that's uh, called a higher type Muller component or a Hitchin component. Um, so when you do this, the. No. Uh, any N. Yeah, not taken. Yeah. 
I mean, really, the, the, requ the requirement on the real form here is that it's a split real form. But it's a, so, for, so for SLN, it can be any N. Um, so this gets replaced um, with a component that I'll call Hitchin. Um, um, and this, uh, so instead of being identified with space of quadratic differentials, is now parameterized by quadratic and higher up to the nth differentials. Um, and this is, again, a component in the moduli space of Higgs bundles for SLNR. And the feature that I want to highlight about, um, so the, 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 the Higgs bundles here, or the corresponding representations, have uh, sort of many um, special interesting properties. But the one that I'll just point out here is that all of these, and this is actually you can take as the definition of this component, these representations all deform to a representation that comes from a Fuchsian representation composed with an embedding of SL2 into SLN. So this is the irreducible representation of SL2 in dimension N. If you take a Fuchsian representation and compose it with this, 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 is, uh, this is the representation of SL2 in dimension n. So it's the irreducible representation of SL2 sitting inside SLN. Uh, so uh, you can think of this as the representation on polynomials of degree n, polynomials in two variables. N minus one. Sorry? Degree n minus 1. Polynomials of degree n minus 1. Oh, right. What what are, are you worrying that there's no abelian differentials? Is that? No no no. I, I mean, I thought that you're supposed to, to, to as you said, take symmetric power within the Fuchsian representation, right? But right. With itself, a bunch of types, right? Yeah. If you take the second symmetric. No, it's uh, not. You get SL three and five. But uh, for SLN, um, I mean, it's the oh, okay, never mind. there is there is only one um, such irreducible representation. Um, but okay, but the point is that uh, these are the representations. So in this component, everything deforms to uh, a representation that factors through this subgroup. Um, there, here's a sort of an, uh, in a way, a sort of an other sort of extreme behavior. Um, if you look at um, SP4, so I, w I, I won't have time to say much about this, but in the case of SP4, there are components, so again, many components, and there are uh, G minus 1 special components, so I'll call them R indexed by an integer, is it g minus 1 or 2g minus 2? Do you remember? It's 2g minus 2. The two of these, these are components um, in the full representation variety for S representations S into sp4r. Um, and these have the feature that none of the representations in here deform to any subgroup. So the so no row in here <coughs> deform to representations <coughs> into any subgroup. So another way of saying that is that if you look at the images of all of these in the group SP4, actually take there's a risky closure, this is dense, well, well, I guess if you don't. This is dense in this group for all the representations in this, these components. Um, another extreme sort of behavior 
is you see in the case of let's say PUPQ or SUPQ with P not equal to Q, so let's say less than Q just to be definite. Um, in this situation, um, there's a component, I'll call it max, you'll see why in a minute, in this representation variety. Where, where every representation uh, stronger than deforms to uh, something that factors through a subgroup actually factors itself through a subgroup. So instead of being a representation into PUPQ is a representation into UPP times UQ minus P. So that's a sort of another a sort of extreme situation. Um, and in fact, there's a sort of a converse. So this, oh, I should say that this, um, this sort of phenomenon where you have components where everything is, uh, actually factors through a, s a smaller group is also seen in this group. So this is uh, one of the real forms of SO2NC that you only, it's the real form that you only see for even over there. Um, this one also has this feature. Um, uh, what was I going to say about this? Uh, ah, right. And so there's a, there's a sort of a converse to this, um, which is a theorem of Pansu and Kim, I think from 2012, um, which says that the, uh, these are really the only situations where this happens. Um, you see, I, I had I'd formulated a concise version that uh, was what I, what I wanted to say. Ah, right. Um, so um, the theorem says that um, uh, representations um, for. So, uh, let me. Would have been so much easier to have the slide. Um, so, right. So for um, oh, okay. So this applies to um, yeah. Sorry, let's put it over here. So if we're looking at G. A real form of one of the classical groups, SLN, SON, or SP. So, if, um, real form of this, then um, all representations deform to one whose image is Zariski dense. Except for those situations. So, so except for the um, SUPQ with P less than Q and SO star 2N cases. So these are the ones where they, they live in the special representation that's labeled max. But uh, this, this theorem um, does have the assumption that the genus of the curve is big enough. And uh, the bound is actually twice the dimension of the group squared. Um, so uh, I mean, the, the, the feeling is that this is uh, just an artifact of the proof, not, um, not uh, of the phenomenon. Um, but uh, their proof did require this. Um, 
but we'll see that, uh, so this is one of the places where um, the perspective of Higgs bundles um, is actually shed some light. Um, so far we've only worked it out in this case, um, but uh, this is a situation where we can see that, that, the, th this is, that, that this theorem applies without the restriction on the genus by looking at the Higgs bundles. Um, okay, so what do the Higgs bundles have to say about this? So, okay, so we, we're not going to get anywhere near where we wanted to get, but let's, <laughs> let's, let, let's persevere. We'll, we'll make adjustments as necessary. Um, okay, so... Um, Rather than try and do things in too general a, a form, I'm going to stick with the group UPQ. And uh, from, for the Higgs bundle point of view, it's more convenient to work with UPQ rather than, well, certainly rather than PUPQ, the adjoint form of this group, because uh, if we work with this, um, with the full UPQ, um, we can think of this as, uh, so this is a real form of GLP plus QC. And so uh, principal bundles with this group are basically vector bundles. And so we can use vector bundle technology rather than principal bundle technology. Uh, we'll see that it doesn't make much difference uh, from the point of view of understanding the relation with um, surface group representations. So, um, so what's a UPQ Higgs bundle? Um, so viewing it as, uh, viewing UPQ as uh, living inside GLP plus Q, a UPQ Higgs bundle is going to be a, a GLN Higgs bundle with some extra conditions that uh, will, allow, will, will make it correspond to representations into UPQ rather than into the full GLN. So uh, a GLN Higgs bundle is a holomorphic bundle over our surface, and the surface has now become a sigma. We've fixed a, 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 a complex structure. So this is a rank P plus Q holomorphic bundle, uh, together with uh, the extra data, which in this case is a holomorphic map from the bundle to the bundle, twisted by the anti-holomorphic, uh, the holomorphic cotangent bundle. Canonical bundle. Um, so if the, so, that's what it would be if it was a GLN Higgs bundle. To make it a UPQ Higgs bundle, uh, the bundle, I mean, you, yeah, the bundle has to decompose as a rank P and a rank Q, and the Higgs field with respect to this decomposition can't be anything, it has to be off diagonal like that. So here the beta is a map from W, the W part of E, to the V part of E twisted by K, and gamma is a map from... So the data defining a UPQ Higgs bundle consists of a pair of bundles, one rank P, one rank Q, a map from W to V and a map from V to W. Um, and uh, I mean, the point about you know the rules of the game here are that um, we're constructing objects that are going to correspond to representations of the fundamental group of this thing into UPQ. And so uh, what that's going to mean is th there'll be a way of constructing flat connections here whose holonomy lies in the UPQ subgroup of GLN. Um, from the point of view of the Higgs bundles to define the moduli spaces, uh, the property that's needed is stability. Um, and um, I was going to say something about stability, but really only for one reason. And um, that reason is that, uh, so there's a notion of stability for the bundle, which corresponds to the corresponds on the one hand to the condition, okay, so let's just say this much. On the one hand, it's, it's the condition that you need to define a moduli space. Um, 
And on the other hand, it's the condition that you need to, the, to construct the connections that are going to have the properties that you want. And these are, you know, sort of the relation between these are sort of the fundamental building blocks in um, non-abelian Hodge theory correspondence. But uh, the main reason that I wanted to mention them, mention stability in this talk, was that so there's a notion of stability and then there's a, um, you know, stability involves a numerical condition that has a strict inequality. Semi-stability means that you relax that and allow equal, but then there's um, a slightly refined version of that called polystability, which means that the bundle is semi-stable and reduces. So uh, in this situation, that means that our UPQ Higgs bundle uh, decomposes into a sum of Higgs bundles, each one of which is a UPQ for smaller p and q. Um, but so that means that uh, the structure group of this has, de has, has reduced to something smaller. And uh, so you see here from in the language of uh, stability and Higgs bundles, uh, the situation where the representation has factored through something smaller. So the, uh, the points in the modular space corresponding to the polystable objects is the Higgs bundle version of um, uh, representations in the representation variety that factor through a subgroup. Um, so maybe I'll leave it at, at that. Um, and uh, say that, okay, so uh, stability, I, I didn't fill in the thing here. Connections. Holonomy in UPQ. Um, okay, so one of the tools that we have for seeing these phenomena and investigating the components of the representation variety. Um, so there were two that uh, I was going to talk about. So the one yeah, was stability, and the other So these, this is not the full toolkit available, but the, the ones that I wanted to talk about today. Stability, and then there's an, a, um, a natural function on the moduli space. This is for any Higgs bundle which is basically com I mean exploiting the Higgs field um, computing the the L2 norm of this Higgs field so okay so there's a lot here that's mysterious um, uh, I mean th this is a uh, the way I introduced it this is a, an, a map from E to E it's act, but you can think of that as a section of the endomorphism bundle of E twisted by the canonical bundle. So if the bundle E is given a metric, then the endomorphisms have a metric, um, and this has a metric coming from the base, so you can compute the L2 norm of phi. The metric that you use is actually part of the machine that relates stability to the connections with the desired property. Um, and they're, um, I mean, the, the, uh, the uh, result that's used here is that if the bundle is, if the Higgs bundle is stable, then it has a special metric that does the job that you want. Um, and you should think of this as the metric determined by that, that theorem. But uh, uh, however, okay, so that's, that, that sort of explains what goes into the definition here. But so this is a, uh, this is a function, a real valued function on M, and we'll see that the properties of this um, um, become a powerful tool for uh, investigating some of the properties of the moduli space. 
Um, okay, so let's see. Um, maybe I'll go straight to the um, what you can do with this function, since there isn't there isn't time to do everything that I was going to do in the slides. Um, okay, so um, what can you do with this function? So the, the important properties of this function um, so it turns out that uh, so this is a uh, it's defined using the, um, the, the Higgs field here the uh, moduli space has um, a very natural action of the circle or even of C star, which involves just scaling the Higgs field. Um, if you restrict that to the circle, just scaling this by a complex number norm 1, uh, it turns out that this map is actually a moment map for that action. So if is a symplectic moment map, for the action that scales the Higgs field by a complex number of norm 1. So again, I mean, uh, there's a lot he's swept under the rug here. Um, uh, I mean, for that, for, to define a symplectic moment map, you have to be in the symplectic world. You have to be living on a symplectic manifold, and you have to have a, a group acting symplectically. Um, but we have all that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so that, so the, the, uh, the importance of this is that it relates the critical points of this function to the fixed points of this um, S1, this one, this uh, S1 action. Uh, the other key thing about this is that this is a proper map, and it's obviously bounded below. This is the L2 norm of something, so it's bounded below by zero. So that means that um, it actually attains its minimum on every connected component of the moduli space. Um, so if you want to um, count the components, uh, a good place to look for information is um, in the minima of this function. Uh, so the minima are included amongst the, the critical points. The critical points you get information from, from that fact. Um, and that allows you to identify the minima. Um, and so this is a, a tool for investigating components. And so I'll sort of summarize what you find for UPQ. Okay, so, so, for, so for UPQ Higgs bundles, with the Higgs bundles, remember, are all, they're all of the form, the E is a V plus W, and the Higgs field always looks like that. Um, so the, the result, so this is, uh, this is an oldish result of mine with Oscar Garcia Prada and Peter Gothen, um, is that the minima are given by the Higgs bundles like this, where one or other of these is 0. Which one it is depends on the uh, invariance of these bundles. These have ranks and they have degrees. And um, uh, so, okay, so, so which one, how do you know which one it is? Well, what you can, here's one way to, to decide which one it is. Sorry. Um, 
the, this function uh, can be written in two ways. It can either be written as the norm of the beta part plus a parameter which is determined by these guys and looks like this. This is an important parameter in the story. This is called the Toledo invariant. Or it's uh, gamma squared minus this. Both of those are always true, um, but the one that identifies the minima depends on the sign of the Toledo invariant. Um, so, um, okay, so this is the, this is the, um, the um, ID card of a minimum uh, for this function. So the space of minima then consists of the Higgs field, of the Higgs bundles determined by a V and a W and one or other of these, because the, depending on which one has, we've chosen to vanish. So if we choose, if we're in a situation where the beta's vanish, then we're left with um, that information defining the, the minima. Um, so what can we say about these sorts of things? So I mean, understanding the connected components then comes down to understanding these guys. Um, well, these, this sort of information, two bundles and a map between them, defines an object that has a modular space in its own right. Um, so these are, in, this is an example of, um, data that consists of two bundles and a map between them. Actually, if I'm writing it this way, uh, yeah, that's okay. For historical reasons, we write the maps from two to one. Don't, don't worry about it. But uh, it means, so this is pairing up. So here, and if we're doing it this way, then E1 is actually WK. E2 is V, and the Higgs field is the gamma. So this is an ex so the, the space of minima is a space of objects like this. So this is a holomorphic triple. It's also an example of bundles and maps associated to a quiver diagram where in this case the quiver diagram is a vertex for each of the bundles and one arrow for one map. Um, so this puts these in this world of modular spaces for quivers. But the, uh, the crucial thing here is that um, there, is, there is a good modular space problem for this. It depends on a notion of stability, but now the stability involves a parameter. So this has actually a family of modular spaces. This a family of moduli spaces, depending on a parameter. The parameter has a range that it's allowed to lie in. And uh, the range is divided at certain critical values where things change. In between the critical values, the moduli spaces are all the same. They allow to change at the critical values, which is where semi-stability becomes um, uh, an issue. Um, so these, this moduli space of this uh, space of minima for the for the function is identified with one of the moduli spaces for these sorts of triples. Which one is it? So this is 
the alpha stable triples where alpha in this case is 2g minus 2. Um, so 2g minus 2 lies somewhere in the range for the parameter for these sorts of triples. It may or may not be a critical value. It's always uh, somewhere in this range, um, but it's, uh, it may or may not be critical. Uh, depends on the A's and the B's. So the question then becomes um, for alpha at this value, is the corresponding moduli space in this family connected? So um, the way we can answer that is to do a sort of a wall crossing game. So um, the moduli space corresponding to alpha at the extreme end of the range, this one is easy to analyze, and you can see that it's connected. Uh, so uh, what remains then is to make sure that as you cross the critical values, the transformations that you undergo as a result in the change of stability uh, preserve the connectedness. And the result um, is that uh, if you look, okay, so, so the, the result is that uh, the analysis works well precisely down to this number that comes up in the Higgs bundle story. Um, and uh, so um, originally when we analyzed this, we could show that um, this worked well under this condition and if we restricted to the stable locus, to the alpha stable locus. The polystability um, was something that we, we couldn't quite handle, but so now um, the, the good news is that if you team up with the right people, then you can solve your problems. Um, so um, with uh, Jochen Heinloth's help, um, So the, the prop, so the proposition is that if the alpha is bigger than this and generic, then the moduli space is connected. So we don't need that anymore. And uh, I mean, the, the, the techniques that he introduced were, were actually replacing the moduli space by the moduli stack. And please don't ask me too much about, <laughs> about uh, the way it goes. Um, but so that's still, so that's great uh, for the generic values. And that's enough to show that um, the uh, space of minima for the, um, this, this function that we're using as a sort of a Morse function on the moduli space is connected. And so therefore, each of the components in the moduli space of UPQ Higgs bundles um, is connected. Um, in you mean the counting components are the same thing as counting minima? Right, right. So if the, if the minima are connected, then there's one component per component of the space, and every component of the space has one. Um, and so you can count the number by counting the minima. And uh, uh, there's only one, so, so fixing A and B Um, this shows that this whole space is connected um, provided this is generic. So what happens if this is not generic? Um, so if this is not generic, turns out that that's still okay. Um, but uh, you have to do something else. Um, Dawn, this is <laughs> what I was hoping. To, all right, so what, so what you do, so if it's not generic, um, so uh, that means it's a critical value. So this is a critical value. 
but the number of critical values is discrete. So if we move just a little bit above here, so if we go to alpha plus epsilon, this is generic. So we know that the moduli space at this value is connected. So we look at the relation between this moduli space and this moduli space. And the reason that there's a relation is because um, if uh, something is alpha plus semi-stable, because the stability condition is a numerical condition on uh, basically integers and this alpha, um, the semi-stability will be preserved if we shift from alpha plus to alpha. So alpha plus semi-stable will imply alpha semi-stable. So there's a map from here to here, which on the objects is just the identity map. It's taking an object, and instead of thinking of it as an alpha plus semi-stable object, think of it as an alpha semi-stable object. So there is a map. So all we need to show uh, is that this is surjective. So how do you show that the map is surjective? Well, you take something in here and suppose that it's not alpha plus semi-stable. So um, so if you have a, um, an object, this is a holomorphic triple, let's just call it T, which is alpha semi-stable but alpha plus unstable. So it doesn't, so we're sort of proving, working by contradiction here. Then uh, if it's alpha plus unstable, then it'll have a maximally destabilizing sub-object, which will give you a handle on this, on, on this triple. So there will be something that is a sub-triple, which is the most unstable uh, part of this. So this is uh, the version for triples of constructing hardener sim infiltrations for bundles. Um, and the key thing is that uh, if we're in the, in the good range, where alpha is uh, not smaller than 2g minus 2, then we can construct a new object switching the roles of the sub-object and the quotient object. And that will construct a new triple which, is, uh, which, which has the good features that it's actually representing the same point as T in this moduli space. And it is less alpha plus unstable than this one, which means that its maximal destabilizing thing has a smaller alpha slope. Um, so e either this will be alpha plus stable or, I mean, semi-stable, or you can iterate this procedure. And each time you'll get a, a finite increment in the stability property, so eventually after a finite number of steps, you'll, you'll arrive at something which is alpha plus semi-stable, showing that this, is, um, that this is a surjective map. So what does all this mean going back to our starting point? So what it means is that in, in these situations, uh, there's only one component for each alpha beta. Um, so in the situations where the component contains a stable point, uh, it rules out the possibility that there are other components consisting entirely of polystable objects, uh, which would have allowed for uh, representations it would allow for the sort of phenomenon that I mentioned at the beginning, where you have a component where everything deforms to some subgroup. Um, in this situation, that's ruled out by the connectedness of these components. The only time that that fails is where there are no stable objects anywhere in the component, and that's the case in these maximal components that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, but, okay, now I have to run in tell my 231 students about arc length. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> okay.